Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I have the honor of kicking off this session today. I first want to say thank you to our hosts, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation and the U.S. African Development Foundation. I also want to welcome our family of entrepreneurs from across the African continent. All of us at Stanford Seed are very hopeful and excited as we embark on this new collaboration with DFC and USADF. We began speaking with the DFC team and USADF a few months ago, and we immediately uncovered that we have deep synergies to explore. For Seed, what we bring to the table is the strength of the Seed Transformation Network and all of our incredible alumni entrepreneurs like you who have been through a year long Seed Transformation program and are still actively engaged with us, growing and scaling and creating impact across your regions. So many of you have come to us uh, with about talking to us about the challenges you face accessing finance and related support. And as you'll learn today, DFC has some very attractive programs and offerings that may be of interest to you. At the same time, DFC is seeking SME clients like you uh, to support your impact journey. And that's what makes this collaboration a great match. Today is just the start of this collaboration. Later in this session, our DFC friends and I will share more about how all of you in the SEED network can go forward from here, work with the DFC, provide your insight to them, and connect with them as they continue to build new programs. I encourage, you, I encourage all of you to stay for the full 90 minutes. DFC pl has planned a really thoughtful session, um, and they have a whole team on board to answer your questions. There will also be important next steps to share as we end the session. So on that note, um, again, uh, thank you to the DFC team uh, for hosting us today. Um, I'll turn it over to my friend, Roxanne Ryan Alozi, who has designed today's incredible program uh, and has been a wonderful partner. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I cannot thank you all enough for taking the time out and um, chatting with us today. We're really excited, excited about the opportunity to speak with you. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Roxanne Ryan Alazier. Um, I'm the managing director here. I work for the chief development officer's office. Um, and, you know, I joined from the private sector. Um, I spent about 10 years on Wall Street and another decade or so in consulting. And it had always been my dream to work in um, the area of international development, specifically trying to create opportunities of access to entrepreneurs who are often underserved and marginalized. Um, as luck would have it, this opportunity has opened up here and I've had the opportunity to do this amazing work. It's incredibly exciting and I couldn't be more delighted to be here with you today. In order to demonstrate the level of commitment that we have to making sure that we foster a world where there is inclusive economic development, I wanted to introduce you to David Marchik. David Marchik is, our, is the DFC's chief operating, in the, chief operating officer. In this role, he manages agency policies, he oversees the business operations, and he coordinates the strategy, the strategy and the priorities for the DFC. Um, prior to this time, he was the director of a non-for-profit um, and really led the nonpartisan non center for presidential transition, where he worked on the Biden transition team. Prior to that, he spent 12 years working at Carlisle. For those of you who aren't familiar with Carlisle, it is one of the premier private equity firms um, globally. Um, it does amazing work domestically as well as internationally, and I'm very excited that he's here to make some remarks. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Roxanne. Thanks for your leadership. <clears throat> Thanks to Davis, excuse me. <clears throat> Thanks to Davis for uh, his leadership. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I always love speaking at programs with affiliated with universities where I didn't get in. And so I remember applying to Stanford uh, Business School and I unfortunately received a very thin envelope as opposed to a very thick packet. And so I'm just honored to be affiliated with anything with Stanford uh, given that rejection many years ago. So uh, thank you very much for having me. So we're very, very excited at the DFC to collaborate on this really important program. We have an all-star lineup uh, for you. Uh, you'll see just a really spectacular group of people from the DFC. And you know, our work here is part of our larger commitment to Africa. 
to investing, to supporting entrepreneurs, to helping drive capital formation, uh, which ultimately will lead to jobs development and growth uh, on the continent. So, you know, I've been lucky at the DFC to have a, a front row seat to see some of the amazing work that Africa's small businesses are doing every day. Offer, they're offering innovative solutions. They face a lot of challenges. I've, I've been to Africa many, many times. At my old firm, we had a business there. It's hard to do business in Africa. It's a hard environment. And these are big challenges. Hard to run a small business anywhere, but we understand this, the challenges of doing business in Africa as well. So the Stanford Seed Program is just doing great work by helping businesses access the tools needed to reach their next stage of growth, basically deal with challenges. And like the Stanford Seed Program, the DFC recognizes that small businesses are the cornerstone of the economy in Africa, the source of new jobs, of innovation and opportunity. And this event is a great opportunity to educate some of the businesses on the line about the Stanford Seed Program that are in the Stanford Seed Program about the ways that we might be able to support your effort. So I think everybody knows because you're running businesses, you're involved in businesses that access to finance is a really significant constraint in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially among small and medium sized businesses. This constraint inhibits economic growth and sustainable development and so one of the things that we're trying to do, and we're helping to address this challenge, is, is through the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program, the ASBC. And you'll hear more about that program today and how you can participate in it. So the DFC and the US Africa Development Foundation, the USADF, I'll be using different acronyms, have developed the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program to increase financial inclusion and our entrepreneurship in Sub-Saharan Africa and serve as a demonstration effect to mobilize private sector financing for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. So the ASBC is a joint development finance corporation and US Africa Development Foundation blended finance program that targets small to medium sized enterprises in select countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that align with our and the foundation's development priorities. And through the Africa Small Business uh, Program, the DFC and the foundation will invest directly in micro, small and medium sized enterprises in eligible countries and high impact sectors across the continent. So the primary goal for the ASBC is to catalyze private sector investment in these countries and regions, and over time play a role, a larger role in developing a sustainable and equitable system of financing for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in the region. And one of our key goals is to expand our impact by working with more with local businesses in the countries where we do projects. So this is an exciting program and it's an exciting day. The DFC is very, very uh, enthusiastic about our, our engagement. Uh, and we hope that through today, by partnering with the SEED program, the ASBC will be better positioned to offer tailored and impactful blended finance tools to innovative African businesses. So we're thrilled to be here today. Look forward to further collaboration and look forward to learning more about all of your success. Thanks so much, Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with us as well. So, you know, without further ado, one of the things that I really want to do is to take this time to talk to you a little bit about the DFC. Now, the thing that I'll ask you to do is if you have questions, save them for the end. Um, there is a Q&A section. So what I would ask that you do is put your questions in the Q&A section. Feel free to put the questions in throughout the discussion. We will bunch them together and then there'll be a Q&A section where there'll be opportunities for you to get your questions answered. And I will be 
answering all the questions alone. I'll be joined by some other really great partners who will be happy to, you know, respond to questions that you have, give you some insights, and hopefully give you a, a better picture of what we do. So for today's agenda, we're going to do three things. We're going to talk a little bit about who we are. We're going to talk about what we do, and then we're going to talk about how you fit into this process. Next page. So, you know, one of the things that's really important to understand is that the mission of the DFC is different than a traditional financial lender. So much of what we're trying to do is really advance U.S. public diplomacy by making investments in emerging markets. You know, we really believe that by making these kinds of investments, we really focus on the best of American values, which is really entrepreneurship and dynamism. We know that you know, this is what the US is known for, and it's a skill and a capability that we are happy to transfer and pass on to our partners throughout the Sub-Saharan African world. Next slide. So you know, I wanna give you a little bit of a context here. So this is really a business presentation, but this is a government agency. So I want you to understand, we don't really act alone. I'm having an issue. We don't act alone. Um, instead, the DFC is part of a, you know, US part of the US government and includes a variety of other agencies. Those agencies include USAID, the State Department, um, the Department of Commerce. Those are just some of the, the partners that we work with really closely. And really now that we are, we've transitioned um, as a part of the Build Act. The Build Act was legislation that was passed probably about a year and a half ago that was really meant to make sure that we underscored and doubled down our commitment to development impact and to low and middle income countries. So we are working even more closely with our partners in the USG to make sure that our activities partner with them to really foster greater economic development. Next slide. Just, have, just to stop, here are we having any challenges with um, communication or is everything okay? Everything's okay. The person dropped off before I could respond to them, but they, they're okay. Okay, great. So let me share with you a little bit about what this, this slide is meant to show you. So as you can see, this, we're a really small organization, but we have a pretty extensive portfolio. So you'll see here, our portfolio is over $30 billion. And if you can believe this, up until maybe the last year and a half ago, we had about 300 staff. So 300 staff being responsible for something like 300, something like over $30 billion, which is amazing. To give you some context, the next size organization, which is the IFC, has a portfolio of about 12 billion and they have a thousand staff. So this is a really hard, hard working group of folks. Um, to give you some context, as you look a little bit closer, one of the things that you will see is that Africa is our second largest market. And, you know, that's, this has actually only recently been the case. So historically, Africa has been either first or second for the last 40 years of operation. What's really interesting about this is the vast majority of what we do remains in small, medium enterprises. In fact, each year, about 75 to 85% of the projects that we commit are small, are, are to small, medium enterprises. The other thing that you'll find interesting is that about 60% of what we do is in low and lower middle income countries. So uh, low and low middle income economies. What that means is that we are really targeting smaller economies that don't have access to finance. And one of the things that we're hoping to do in the work that we do today in asking you to participate in the survey is to get a little bit more competitive intelligence about the kinds of specific challenges that you face, particularly if you're in a low or low to middle income economy as it relates to access and finance. Next slide, please. Okay. So I think what's really great about this, this is the group that I'm a part of. I'm a part of the, the um, Office for the Chief Development Officer. One of the things that we are doing is with the BUILD Act, we're really doubling down on our commitment to, the, to impacting the communities that we serve. 
So one of the things that we have focused on as an organization is that over the next five years, our objective is to invest more than $25 billion and mobilize an additional $50 billion by the end of 2025. The objective is not just to move money, right, to get money out the door, which is incredibly important, but it's also to reach an additional 30 million people. Our goal is to, in reaching those 30 million people, really make sure that we're prioritizing low-income communities, creating jobs, which is something that we have always been committed to, introducing technology, because we understand that in doing so, it's a great way to um, foster um, knowledge transfer, and it's also a way to enable economies to leapfrog into greater development. We're also focused on empowering women and underserved communities, not just with jobs, but by giving you opportunities to access finance. So, you know, one of the goals that we have is we have always historically been an organization that has been focused on creating jobs, supporting women, but we are really being laser focused on making sure that as we think about creating and diversifying our client base, which is another one of our specific goals, that we are really focusing on empowering women, empowering underserved communities, marginalized communities, and giving them access to finance. Next slide. Okay, so I think this is a really helpful slide. Um, this is to give you a little bit of a sense of the uh, investment priorities that we have. So those investment priorities include climate mitigation and energy. So to give you some context, We've always been focused on energy and infrastructure, making sure that people have access to infrastructure. But under the new administration, we've really doubled down our efforts on um, activities that also are meant to mitigate um, the effects of climate change. In terms of healthcare, which is another area of focus and investment, I, I think it's safe to say that healthcare and COVID-19 right now are going hand in hand. So we've made some really important investments in making sure that we strengthen access to vaccines, but also that we strengthen the underlying um, value, healthcare value chain that many countries face. We recognize that, and we've even seen challenges in our own um, value chain, but we recognize in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it, as well as other emerging markets, that the value chain is broken. And even just the access, once a product is made, to get it into the hands of someone who needs it is very difficult. So we've really focused on strengthening the entire value chain. We've actually hired someone who's an expert in this space to really look at ways in which our investments could be the most catalytic. Um, we've also we're also focused on critical infrastructure. That's always been our bread and butter, and it's something that we will continue to focus on. We're focused on food security, water, and technology, and of course, small businesses and women and entrepreneurs. So here's the question that people usually ask me: Hey, my business is not listed here. Am I an investment priority? Should I get off the phone right now? And the answer is no. We invest in a variety of industries, from tourism to manufacturing to education to fintech. So there's opportunities. There are very few industries we don't invest in. There are some obvious ones like gaming, tobacco, that sort of thing. But it's most important for you to talk with our team, and you're going to get introduced to some of those individuals soon. Uh, but talk with our team so that you can get a sense for whether you know, we're a good fit for you given the goals of your organization. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what we do. Now sharpen your pens and pencils because this is where it's gonna be really, really interesting. And I'm hoping that this part is going to be educational that you'll get as much as you possibly can. I'm gonna slow things down here because it's really important for you to understand what I'm trying to share. Okay, so these are the five products that the DFC offers. The first is direct loans. Um, it's, you know, it's very, very simple, but it's the loan that you take out when you want to um, purchase something. So, one of the things that's really important in terms of the investments that we make is we're always looking for things that are catalytic, things that will create jobs, things that will expand the growth of an organization. We're not really 
looking at um, refinancing or being a source of cheap debt. Our goal is really to invest in productive activities that really lead to fostering, that will help to foster growth. So direct loans is what one of the products that we provide. We have, um, we can do loans in two sets. One is we do loans that are between one to $50 million. That would be housed in the Office of Development Credit. Between 50 to 1 billion, that tends to be infrastructure. That gets housed in the Office for Structured Finance. In addition, one of the things that we have available is because we have this close partnership with USAID, um, and you'll hear from Jesse Karate, who's the managing director for Africa, who leads that, that activity, is if there's an opportunity for USAID to partner with us and to act as um, either a source of technical assistance or if they want to subsidize, then there's actually a route in which you can work with us through um, what is called the Mission Transaction Unit. Jesse leads that group up, and then you'd get the additional resources of operating with USAID. It's a mouthful. The most important thing for you to understand is that we have direct loans all the way up to $1 billion US dollars. We also work with USAID in case that's one of the routes that you want to take, um, and they can support you in your activities as well. We provide loan guarantees. So really what the loan guarantee program is, is it's an opportunity for us to share the risk with um, someone as they decide to expand. So it often works really well, and you'll see this is the case with one of our clients, but it often works really well for local financial institutions. You know, we recognize that for so many financial institutions, they're a little nervous about investing in women. Sometimes they're nervous about investing in small businesses. So one of the things that the loan guarantee program does is it says, you know, I will come alongside you. Maybe I'll do first loss, or maybe I will partner and do a 50-50% loss with you so that this way, that local financial institution feels much more comfortable making um, an investment in um, smaller businesses. What we have found, and I can, I can tell you about a specific experience that I had with a client in the Middle East, is that they have real concerns about investing in small businesses with fears that the default rate would be as high as 20%. They even have the ridiculous view that maybe women would not be great risks. Well, I can tell you, they ultimately found out that the default rates were closer to three to 5% and women turned out to be their best risk. So that's why we do this work, right? Is that it creates this opportunity for um, local lending institutions to realize that there's great opportunities among the small businesses in their nations and to recognize that maybe the risks aren't as great as they thought. Political risk insurance. Um, a political risk insurance is a product that is close to my heart. That's how I first learned about the DFC. I spent about four or five years at AIG as a political risk underwriter, and DFC was the organization that was doing this work the best. Um, it really provides coverage for loss of assets kind of due to things like terrorism or nationalization or political risks that are out of your control, but then make it impossible for you to pay back your investors. So let's say you have an infrastructure investment and then a new leadership team comes into office and they decide to nationalize that infrastructure project that you put your money in. Well, then it makes it very hard for you to pay back your investors. The other thing that political risk insurance does is that particular insurance gives us the opportunity to bring to bear the tools of the U.S. government. What, with the tools of the U.S. government, what we're often able to do is to speak to our partners in the embassy, speak to our partners at state, and then work with the local government, perhaps to say, hey, look, we really want to foster greater economic development. This person who's here wants to be a good citizen, wants to be a good private sector actor, nationalizing you know this infrastructure project isn't in the best interest of fostering greater economic investment and often that kind of ability to work and use our partners and partner with our partners in the u.s government smooths out activities and really helps to keep the private sector humming which is something that we really care deeply about 
Okay. So two newer products that we now have, one is equity financing and one is technical, de um, technical development. And some of this has even changed since, you know, I first started doing these presentations. But equity is something that originally we couldn't do. We had a quasi-equity product years ago, but what equity enables us to do is to partner um, with um, businesses in two ways. The first is that, number one, we may partner with an investment fund. So we may give up to 30% of um, our investment of our dollars into an investment fund that is in the process of raising. Um, and then those investment funds then go out, find portfolio, portfolio companies to invest in. The second thing that we're doing is we are premiering smaller investments. You're actually going to hear from the managing director of that particular group. Um, those smaller investments are tend to be between two and ten million dollars, and those investments are going into specific firms. They're meant to be catalytic, and you know, really to foster greater development. The other thing that I would say is that there are instances, and this is one of the things we want to do more of, is in addition to investing in the investment funds, also investing in directly into the portfolio companies associated with those investment funds. Then the final product that we have, and this is one people are always really interested in, is technical development, technical assistance. So one of the things that we found, you know, when we were OPIC, OPIC is the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That is our predecessor. That's um, the organization that was founded under the Nixon administration, I believe, in 1972 or 1970. Um, was you know years ago we wanted very often to to help some companies. There are companies that we would find that hey we would be excited about investing with them, but they needed a little bit of support. They needed some technical assistance. We didn't have those dollars. With the passage of new legislation via the Build Act, I mentioned that before, we are now able to offer technical assistance specifically to projects that we plan to invest in. It tends to be within the range of 100000 to $4 million. We don't have a big pot of money, so we have to be very judicious. Um, and it's for things like training, feasibility, feasibility studies, things like that that I think are really meant to make sure that we increase the development impact of the project that we've planned to invest in. So now I've talked with you about direct loans, loan guarantees, political risk insurance, equity financing, and technical development. Next slide. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about how we find deals. So this entire little visual that you're seeing is actually our project life cycle. It goes from sourcing to monitoring, and I will talk about that later. But I wanted to share with you how we generally tend to find projects. Um, much of what we do, frankly, is with existing clients, given that we're a small organization and there aren't actually a million deals out there. That's a lot of where we're getting a lot of our deals. What's exciting about this time is that with the new legislation where we've moved, um, where we've transitioned under the Build Act from the OPIC to now the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, one of the really exciting things that we can do is we can now lend to companies that don't have a U.S. sponsor. That means that you, know, you don't have to have a partner that's American, that's an American citizen, um, in order to work with us, in order to be able to access um, financing from us. So now we're using things like embassy referrals, town halls, events like this, um, in order to really reach out to a wide, to, to cast a wider net in terms of the clients that we reach out to. Um, historically, we've attended conferences. This was in the pre-COVID world. Hopefully that will continue to happen. We've also worked very closely with financial institutions. So you'll actually hear from a financial institution as we do a client interview. But what's really great about financial institutions is that in smaller economies where the loans that you're trying to access um, 
are really just too small for what we can do if we work with the bank either by providing liquidity to the bank or by direct liquidity in terms of dollars or by providing some kind of investment guarantee, we give them cover to really be able to support small and medium enterprises, women-owned enterprises, and micro enterprises as well. And so that's really an exciting way for us to engage with smaller economies. Next slide. Okay, so this is really exciting. I know it doesn't sound like it, but it is, I promise you. So it's our project life cycle. The reason why I wanted to share this with you is that we always get this question. How long does it take for me to get the money, right? Um, that's ultimately the thing that people are concerned about. But this is a pretty extensive process and I wanted you to understand a little bit about how the sausage gets made. Um, so in terms of sourcing to commitment, so that's the sourcing and then approval stage, right? That can take anywhere from two months to 20 months, but that depends on three things. The complexity of the deal. Um, so larger infrastructure projects, as you imagine, would take long. The size of the business. Um, and so again, if it's a smaller corporate finance project and it's pretty straightforward, that might take a shorter period of time. Um, but then the other thing is, is the amount of time it takes for you to respond to us with high quality information. And that's really the purpose of this conversation. It's a starter. It's meant to give you some more of the tools that you'll need to better understand our process and to be as responsive as possible. So to the extent that you can give us information in a timely manner, that better enables us to work with you. Um, and I'll give you a, an interesting thing tidbit, I, before I was in this role, I worked in development impact. And development impact is part of the Office of Development Finance. And we were always wondering how that process works and the kind of bottlenecks that we have. And one of the things we found as a bottleneck is that it often takes time for people to gather the information that they need. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to address that. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we're addressing that later. But the process is, you know, it's like a funnel, you know, number of projects come in, lots of people are interested, but, you know, we, we have this kind of process that we have to walk through. The first kind of critical part of the process is screening. And so at the screening process, there are a couple of key things we're looking to, to understand from you. The most important is the use of proceeds. How do you plan to use the money? So we're not likely to fund things like refinancing or um, you know, acquisitions if it's a function about getting access to cheaper debt. It's really about productive use of that asset. So it's about expansion to a new location, establishment of a new product line, things that we believe kind of foster economic de de development, create jobs, create opportunities, um, help to grow the local tax base, and often are things that have these cool, I call them knock-on effects, where you, know, you expand a product line, or you expand into a new region, and it turns out there are other businesses along the value chain, both at the, as a source and then as distribution that then need to support um, the work that you're doing. That's the kind of economic activity that we tend to support. During the pre-screening stage, we're gonna be looking at things like the bankability of the project, um, meaning you know, how, ha how well have you thought through you know, your ability to, to raise funding. Have you started raising funding? Um, do you have other investors? Do you have collateral? Do you have equity of your own? Um, and then we really start looking right at the beginning at your impact, the likelihood that what you're doing is gonna have a catalytic impact in the, the local economy in which you reside. We're gonna look at the strength of the management team right up front. Because these markets can be challenging, we recognize that in these markets, you have to be really a top entrepreneur. We're gonna be looking to see whether you have really great industry experience, as well as do you have great national and regional experience. Those things are pretty important. And all of that happens before 
the application is even completed. So, you know, as you think about putting information together, those are the things you want to be thinking about. Bankability, use of proceeds, how impactful your work is going to be, telling the story about who your management team is, um, and then also, you know, thinking about who you are as a business. Once we get to that, we're going to start with the process of putting, having you put together an application. When there's a, the application's been completed, um, then there's going to be, you know, an initial conversation to evaluate the process, to, to evaluate the project. We'll talk with all of the stakeholders, and then we'll start the process of due diligence. So due diligence happens in two ways here. Because we're different than a Citigroup or a JP Morgan, that's my background, um, where they're just primarily looking at the um, financial strength and the credit strength of the business, we're also going to be looking at the development case for the business as well. So one of the things you're going to find is usually, I mean, we haven't been able to do this as much um, with COVID, there'll be an investment officer, they'll go out and take a look at the business. They're going to be looking for the um, operational effectiveness of the business. They're going to be starting to dive into the financials of the business. They're going to be taking a look at the balance sheet, which is a snapshot of your performance. They're going to be taking a look at your cash flow to see the impact that, you know, this additional debt would have on your cash flow. Um, and then there's a whole other group of people who conduct what is called a clearance, which is really about asking you questions about the jobs that you're likely to create, the ways in which your activities are meant to be inclusive, the ways in which your activities are meant to be innovative um, to the local market and will have an impact in fostering economic growth. And so I think this kind of way that we look at, at, at um, investing is completely different than a traditional banking outfit because we're looking not only at the financial and the credit picture, we're also looking at the impact picture. And you know, very often we're willing to take some risks um, in terms of uh, the financial picture if the impact story is good and if there's a way to really make sure that the impact is there. But please note, it's a project, our goal is to ensure that these projects are also um, financially solvent, because if they're not, then we don't get to see the impacts that we want to see. Okay. Anyway, beyond that, then there's the process. Once we've done all of that, there's an entire process that we go through during the approval phase, where there is a credit team who will evaluate the credit capabilities of the, the project. They'll evaluate, you know, whether this is a good credit risk. But, and then for projects that are between one and say $20 million, those things get handled in-house within the Office of Development Credit. And you're actually gonna talk, hear from someone in that group. Between 20 and say $50 million, those projects go to investment committee. And then for $50 million or more, they go through credit, they go through the investment committee, pretty, uh, the investment committee as well as to board. So it's a pretty extensive process. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to share that with you because I want to set your expectations. This is not um, a simple process of, you know, you put in, you know, an application and you get your money. It, it can be extensive. It can be a little time consuming. But here's the wonderful thing, and you're going to hear this from clients. Once you've gone through this process, what they have found is that it opens up this world of opportunities where, um, you know, the work that we do is done in, in terms of really providing demonstration effect. Because then what happens is they then get really great access to national banks, regional banks, and often international banks and international financial institutions who are interested in now in doing business with them. And you're going to hear that from clients. Next slide. Okay, so I want to underscore this concept again. So really what's really important here for you to understand is the idea of economic, that there are three pillars that we're looking at. You're going to get a copy of this presentation, so no need to worry. But the three pillars are economic growth, innovation, and inclusion. So whenever you put together a presentation, here's my recommendation. This is just my tidbit. I would really be thinking about 
how your project is going to foster economic growth, how it's gonna create jobs, how you know your business and the, the, the role that you play in the value chain could support other businesses um, and how it could support even the industry's growth. Innovation, you know, we're, we often are looking for things that lead to knowledge or technology, a techn technological transfer, transfer that really help to foster environmental sustainability or things that are just kind of innovative in terms of, you know what, we need a financial, we need a digital uh, way to access finance in this particular market. All of these kind of really cool things that help you to leapfrog into the next stage of development, those are the kinds of things that we want to be able to invest in. And then inclusion. Um, inclusion goes without saying, but it's really important as an organization that we are supporting underrepresented populations in our investments. So that be women, young adults, um, people with disabilities, other underserved groups who didn't traditionally have access to finance. Next slide. How you fit. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna just walk through a very simple case. And I think this is gonna give you a sense for what often happens because maybe you might see yourself in this. This is actually a project that we have decided to finance um, or, or that is now as part of our portfolio. But I wanted to give you a sense for what kinds of information we get, what they got right and what they could get better. So, you know, this is the first kind of little paragraph that we got about this particular project. And it's pretty good because it definitely demonstrates, it supports one of our investment priorities. Um, from a development story, it does an effective job of showing how this project is both in, innovative and inclusive, right? So two pages, I just showed you that innovation and inclusiveness are really important and they've highlighted something here. Um, it also lays out how they plan to use the money. It's use of proceeds. And it's not to just refinance. Um, they're not just seeking cheap debt. They actually want to grow this business. Um, they actually want to put the money towards productive use. So this is really good. But it could be better. And there's a couple of things that are missing that I think the next couple of pages will help you to better understand. So I'm going a little bit long, but I think I wanna make sure that I cover some of this for you. So the five key areas that you want to make sure your presentation covers, any information that you provide to us covers are the following. Bankability, impact additionality, form policy alignment, not as worried about that, political risk um, and management capacity. So when we talk about bankability, it's really about number one, um, how much money have you raised so far and do you plan to commit any equity? It's really important for us to be sure that you have some skin in the game. Um, we wanna know if the project has the ability, has you have the ability to demonstrate that the project has commercial viability. Um, you know, who are you versus the other competitors in this space? And can you provide a track record that demonstrates the bankability of this project. Impact and additionality. Does this address a significant economic constraint? What's nice about that particular question is that's also a really good business question. Is there a, a problem that you're trying to, to solve that you think could really support the growth of the local economy? Um, digital is one that always comes to mind. To mind education, healthcare, tourism, all of these you can tell that story about the potential impact of your project. The other thing is, you know, we're gonna really be asking, you know, have you reached out to your local lenders and what kinds of challenges you faced? We ask that because our goal isn't to crowd out the local bank. It's not to crowd out the regional bank. Our goal is to be additional. So we're gonna ask you, you know, have you looked into local financing? And very often people have, and usually what they tell us is that, you know, the interest rates are too high or the tenors are too short, or it'd be impossible for me to grow my business with that kind of debt load at the time and the repayment that I have time period that I have to pay things back in. Foreign policy alignment. You know, the big thing to note is we're gonna be just paying attention to whether this could have an impact in the loss of US jobs. That's our job to evaluate it, but just keep that in mind. Political risks. 
So, you know, we recognize that, you know, there are sometimes really challenging political environments that as entrepreneurs you face. We don't expect you to say that there are no political challenges. We just want you to show that you've been thoughtful about it and that you have some things that you've thought out and put in place or have considered and have put on paper around how you would address those risks. And then the other thing is, the final thing is management capacity. As I said before, we, are, we recognize that these are challenging environments and challenging environments often mean that you need even better skills. So industry skills are key, regional country skills are key. And then also, if you have other partners, um, other shareholders who are investing with you, we're gonna wanna know who they are. We're gonna wanna do, um, we're gonna want to have a bit of a sense around their character. We're also gonna wanna know about their expectations. If they expect to get their money paid back in five years and they're not as concerned about impact, we could see that there could be some challenges. And so those are the kinds of questions that we're gonna be focused on. We're gonna skip the next slide and then we're going to go back. Here we go, because we're kind of running out of time. So you can you you can take a look at that other slide, but that's just a little bit more of a cheat sheet with some more information if you are developing a business plan. The other thing that I, I want to keep in mind are these things. Um, so just to give you some sense, again, the key things are additionality, bankability, management capacity, and then the other thing that ultimately we're going to ask you for is we're going to be asking you for um, uh, 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 a template with you know things like your balance sheet, your income statement, and your cash flow statement. Those are the kinds of things that we need to be able to really evaluate your business. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to me. I actually would like to have Jesse Karate. He's gonna be speaking next. He's the managing director. He leads the mission transaction unit. Oh wait, actually, Viv Jane is gonna be chatting first. She's gonna be sharing a little bit about how we work with you in the field. She's gonna give you some really great insights. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, good afternoon, or actually, sorry, good morning, everyone. I suppose it's um, early in your day. Um, I am Viv Jane, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm the Regional Managing Director for Africa at DFC, um, and I, uh, lead a team of six other uh, investment professionals who are based across sub-Saharan Africa. And essentially what we try to do is find interesting, innovative, and eligible opportunities to expand and diversify DFC's client, client base on the African continent. And so, um, you know, Roxanne's presentation hit on a lot of the key points um, in terms of the types of deals that we're looking for. Um, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa and covering Sub-Saharan Africa broadly. Um, and DFC has been doing a lot of interesting work to increase our um, business development and deal execution and overall portfolio in Africa. And one of those things is last year in 2020, we launched a program called our Africa Investment Advisor Program that essentially established a regional team for DFC to ensure that one, we're close to the markets we're trying to work in. So we have real-time market knowledge. Two, we're taking advantage of all the great new flexibilities we have as DFC, you know, the ability to partner with both African businesses and American businesses. Um, and three, that we're really being um, forward leaning when it comes to uh, business development, as opposed to waiting for people to come to us. Um, and you know, that includes working more closely with some of our colleagues at the various embassies and USAID missions around Africa. So this team of Africa Investment Advisors was launched last year. Um, we have, in addition to myself in Johannesburg, we have six others um, based across different parts of the continent in um, centers of commerce to enable uh, greater business interaction. Um, I manage the team and essentially what we spend over 50% of our time doing 
is trying to source and vet opportunities and take them to um, screening so that they can be added to DFC's pipeline. We also support on due diligence um, in the wake of the pandemic, given our staff travel has been very limited. The team has been really critical to doing a lot of operational and site due diligences to ensure we're still moving ahead business as usual. Um, they started in September of last year, and I would say already the team has probably done over a dozen site due diligences to ensure deals stay on track, um, which is quite exciting. Um, and then, of course, DFC is making long term investments. And so monitoring is a really important part of our work, um, ensuring that we're tracking not only development impact, but just how the, the project is performing financially. And so that's been another area where we're involved. Um, the an Africa Investment Advisor Program is implemented in partnership with the Department of State and Cross Boundary. Um, Cross Boundary is an, an international advisory firm that has a focus on emerging markets. Um, they want a competitive procurement to um, help us by identifying and um, essentially providing this really talented team. Next slide. So this map just sort of breaks down where exactly folks are located. And I'm sure for those of you who've been working on the African continent or in matters relating to the African continent, where we have people based is no surprise. So we have two people in West Africa, one in Dakar covering Francophone West and Central Africa, one in Lagos covering Anglophone West Africa. We have two folks in Johannesburg in addition to myself, so three total. Um, the first covers Southern Africa ex Lusophone, and the second covers Pan Africa plus Lusophone. Um, then we have two people in East Africa, one based in Addis covering Horn of Africa, and the second based in Kenya, Nairobi covering um, the rest of East Africa. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a little bit about the team, and here I want to particularly call out, and I'm going to be introducing them in just a moment, two specific members of the Africa team. So this is a little bit about their backgrounds, and really this is just to show you that, you know, we've um, recruited, I think, some really um, highly qualified individuals with a passion for African markets, investment experience, and just all around um, lovely people to work with. Um, so two of our investment advisors, Blenna Bebe based in Addis and Jacob Flewelling based in Joburg have graciously volunteered to be the points of contact for those of you that are going to be submitting um, projects for consideration to DFC. Um, I will introduce them in just a moment, but before I do, maybe we could go to the next slide and then I will um, allow them to say hello and maybe a few lines about themselves. So, um, Following this town hall, and really the purpose of this town hall is to get you all acquainted with the capabilities of DFC and um, to help us potentially partner with all of you. And so what we ask is, um, if you are interested in exploring um, financing from DFC, um, in addition to, you know, perhaps reviewing some of the really helpful information that Roxanne provided, um, we ask that you put together and share your invest project proposal or teaser, hopefully highlighting as many of the, the areas of project eligibility as you can, um, and send that either to Blenna Bebe or Jacob Flewelling, and they, or you can send it to both of them, and they can decide how they want to um, divide it up, and they will be the ones to um, provide you with feedback, and they will be holding um, office hours consultations with those of you who have projects that appear um, to be DFC eligible. So with that, I'd like to just briefly introduce my colleagues. So perhaps we'll start with Blen. Blen, would you like to get on camera and just um, say a few words about yourself? Perhaps um, maybe just what um, what some of the work you've been doing at DFC this past year has been like, or your, some of the sectors that are of particular interest to you? Thank you, Bip. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Blaina Bebe. I am uh, DFC's African Investment Advisor uh, for Horn of Africa. I am, as Bip mentioned, responsible for um, DFC's sourcing and business development activity um, in the region. Uh, I've been with the DFC for the last uh, year or so, and I've been partaking interesting projects on the continent, uh, ranging from financial institutions, so large infra projects, and uh, several off-grid energy projects. And uh, I, I uh, have 
quite uh, extensive financial background, uh, both in, in the States and uh, uh, in Addis. And I know firsthand some of the challenges that SMEs and entrepreneurs such as yourselves are facing. Uh, so I look forward to potentially supporting your business uh, through one of our programs and collaborations with the, with the DFC. Thank you. Thank you, Blen. Um, and just to clarify, even though Blen covers Horn of Africa for us, given some um, political slowdown in some of our activities there, she's actually open for your solicitations and proposals on all um, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa um, for the purpose of this group. Um, then next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jacob Lewelling. Jacob, would you mind introducing yourself to the group and similarly sharing a little bit about what you've been doing and some of your areas of interest? Sure, of course, happy to. Thanks, Vib. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Llewellyn. Uh, I'm based in Johannesburg, um, but I've, I've typically worked on transactions in Lusophone Africa, as well as certain Pan-African uh, investments. My background, uh, just briefly, is uh, I was spent the last several years at the Trade and Development Agency, the Project Preparation Agency of the USG. Before that, uh, I was actually with what was then OPIC uh, in the Political Risk Insurance Department. Um, Glenn and I joined at the same time, along with the rest of the team. So we've, uh, we had our 2 weeks of training uh, beginning last September and, and got right to work after that. Um, and just some demonstrative or illustrative uh, transactions that I've had an involvement with over the last several months are a medical oxygen deal uh, in East Africa, a critical minerals uh, project uh, in Lusophone Africa, as well as agro commodities uh, that's more pan-African in nature. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and um, I would just suggest again, even though um, even though Jacob and Blynn ha are have specific areas of coverage, um, that you reach out to both of them. And if it turns out that a member of our team is better suited to handle your query, we will take care of that internally. But you can use them as your next as your ports of call to DFC. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roxanne. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, it's great to have them participating. Um, again, one of the things that we'll, we can make available is we can have a Calendly link so that you all can set up some times specifically with Jacob and Blend. That'll we'll send that out to you after the fact. But again, it's really important to prepare some of the information. Again, I'll provide you with this presentation or some of the key kind of points to consider so that you will really you know be able to use that time wisely that you have with jacob and blen and, and that you, you know there'll be some really great value out of it um they're doing an excellent job finding and sourcing great deals from the field and we're excited that um Viv has been leading this fantastic effort um the next thing i want us to do is i want to introduce you to jesse karate jesse is the managing director for the mission transaction unit as I said, there is a part of our organization that works with USAID very, very closely. We're trying to really integrate with that group a lot more closely, and Jesse's been leading those activities. He's also been the spearhead for the Africa Small Business um, Business Catalyst Program. Come on, come on, Jesse, and just share a little bit about the differences between both programs. Great. Thank you, Roxanne, um, and thank you to the whole team who has presented so far, uh, I think that helps to actually provide a good deal of context for um, how to compare what DFC's uh, sort of traditional products are uh, alongside this new, this new program, which we're actually hoping um, your participation and your active feedback will help to shape to, to a degree. Um, if we could go to slide, I think it's 21. In the presentation, yeah, 21, that would be great. Awesome. Um, so just very briefly, and then I'll actually uh, kick it over to Davis just to speak a little bit more about the survey that that we're going to conduct to help inform the, the design of these uh, of these products. Um, so Roxanne outlined, I think, very helpfully the typical eligibility requirements, uh, including things like uh, transaction size. Um, ESG requirements, et cetera, um, for all DFC products. The ASBC product um, is something that we're in the process of developing and launching this fall. Um, and the key sort of aim for the, pro of the program is to be able to push a bit more down market in terms of investment size. 
Um, and so, as you can see on this slide here, uh, traditional DFC products um, tend to be at least a million dollars in DFC exposure and above um, in order for us to be able to consider that. Um, for this program, the ASBC program, will actually be pushing much further down and much lower in terms of individual ticket sizes. Um, you could see here 50000 to $500,000 is what we're thinking about. Um, but again, as I mentioned at the outset here, we're keen to understand from you all um, what your key constraints are uh, and the type of uh, sort of products and structuring that are most useful to you given your individual uh, business circumstances. Uh, a couple other things I will flag in terms of distinctions between how um, DFC operates and really as a subset of DFC, this ASBC program will operate uh, in addition to the loan size element here. Um, so, because of our partnership with the US Africa Development Foundation, which, which Dave mentioned at the outset here, um, we have a preference for African owned entities in the ASBC program. Um, the product will only be available as well within Africa. Um, and as a part of the financing package, um, there will be an opportunity to, to apply for grant funding alongside, um, alongside the, uh, the financing that DFC will, will be providing. And that's our way to help to provide sort of a blended finance, um, uh, solution here to businesses. Um, I will actually pause there and turn it back to Davis now to speak a little bit about, I guess, the, the next slide here on the, um, the survey and to bring us forward in the agenda. Thanks very much, Jesse. Um, and uh, hi, everybody again. Um, so you've heard a bit about the classic DFC products so far and this really exciting news that Jesse shared about the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program. Um, we have a unique opportunity with DFC as the Stanford Seed Transformation Network. DFC, as Jesse mentioned, is actively interested in your needs and your challenges and your thoughts. So what SEED did with uh, our partners at DFC, we created a very short five-minute survey, uh, which will help DFC shape its Catalyst program and other offerings. So I'm going to put it in the chat box right now. Uh, so we just ask that you take a few minutes to take the survey towards the end of the call. Um, or, or now it's also in your inbox, I believe right now in email. So you'll see it in your email. Um, but it really will provide DFC an opportunity to act on customer feedback, which is all of you, uh, in the network. So, so please take the 5 minutes, just take this 5 minute survey for us. Um, and, uh, uh, we would really appreciate it. And also just a note before I kick back to Jesse and Roxanne, you'll, you'll might see a survey as you close the WebEx window. You can disregard that. That's just part of the template. Just please use this link in chat or in your email inbox, the email from Stanford seed. Okay. Thanks Jesse and Roxanne. Thanks so much, Davis and Roxanne back over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, you know, we've shared a lot of information. Um, but I recognize that one of the most important things that we can do is give you the opportunity to get customer voice, to really hear from other clients who've worked with us about the challenges, the ups, the downs. Um, and they've been very, very honest. These two particular men, I've really enjoyed getting to know them. I've talked with them over the course of the last year and they participated in other town halls. And let me give you a little bit of background about both of them. Um, one is um, Ambrose Hufue. Ambrose Hufue has worked in the finance industry for the last 10 years, leading investment and private equity firms based in Ghana and the United States, um, as such firms at, such as Gold Coast Fund Management, State Street Corporation, and the Ghana Growth Funds. He was actually a part of the core team that worked on the acquisition and refinancing of the Liberian Enterprise Development Financial Company. He's here and he's going to be participating in the interview today. The other person who's going to be joining us in a little bit is Peter Najonjo. He is the co-founder and CEO of Twigo Foods, a company that aggregates informal retail demand and organize an efficient supply, an efficient supply chain for fresh and dry foods. 
um, prior to that, he spent 21 years with Coca-Cola Company, um, being the president of Western Central African Business. Um, he was at one point the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kenya, Kenya and voted among the top 100 young leaders in Africa by force. So these two men are exactly, you know, they, they inspire me. Um, I've shared their story with friends of mine. My husband's an entrepreneur. So I love the story of entrepreneurs making it in sometimes really challenging environments. And I'm often really inspired by them because, you know, I know it's easy in easier places to be successful, but in places where there are challenging regulatory environments, political challenges, these men have found ways to be successful and we have the joy of being able to partner with them. So I'm going to ask some questions. Um, I don't know, would you guys mind being interviewed together or do you, it's a totally up to you. I can do it together and just kind of hear from you and let's just have a conversation if that's okay. I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Thank you so much. For so, you guys are great. can help you together. Yeah, you guys are great. Um, you're two, two of my favorite entrepreneurs, um, which I tell you all, all the time. But talk to me, each of you, I've given, I've sent, you know, I've shared a little bit about your bio, but talk to me about your journey to the role that you have right now. Okay, so um, once again, good afternoon and good morning, uh, depending on where you are. Um, I have been in the investment banking industry for about 18 years, uh, working with uh, State Street uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and also in Ghana, uh, working with uh, Ghana Growth Fund, and eventually uh, coming to Liberia to head an SME uh, company, uh, specifically a development finance institution called Liberian Enterprise Development Finance Company uh, in Liberia. Um, I've also had the experience of working uh, risk with um, acquisition and uh, restructuring and turnaround of about three companies in Liberia. Uh, in addition to what I do, one of them is a hotel, the second is a radio station, and the third one is a commercial bank. Uh, so let me just add a bit about uh, what I do now, uh, talking about Liberian Enterprise Development Finance Company, which is an investee company of the DFC. So uh, Liberian Enterprise Development Finance Company gives loans and technical assistance to SMEs in Liberia. And our focus is on the ordinary Liberian. Uh, we have a lot of foreigners doing business. Uh-oh, I think we had some technology. Yeah, it looks like he has network congestion. Okay, while he's doing uh -huh. that, Peter, do you wanna share a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne, and thank you for having me here today. Always a pleasure. Uh, whenever I get to uh, share this uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the ecosystem that you've so created, and uh, really proud of the work that you're doing. Cannot do without. <laughs> Sorry, did hey, I get disconnected somewhere? Hey, hey, Ambrose. We want because we lost you. Would you mind if we just talk with, with Peter? I'm just going to ask Peter the same question I just. Asked. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Roxanne. So I'll share a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm married with uh, four kids. I live out here in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, did most of my schooling here in Kenya and in the U.S. And uh, I worked for the Coca-Cola company for 21 years. Six of those years, I was CEO for the business in the west coast of uh, the east coast of the continent, uh, managing six countries. I did that for six years. And then I moved over to uh, Nigeria, where I was president for Western Central Africa, managed about 33 countries from there. And what my role in Coca-Cola did is that it gave me a glimpse on the structure of informal retail across the continent and just some of the challenges, the fragmentation of this industry, 
was uh, creating, especially around food security. So, uh, seven years ago, I co founded uh, Trigger Foods with my uh, co founder, partner, uh, Grant Brook. Uh, he's now uh, running another, uh, another business, a fintech uh, business uh, out of uh, Delaware. But uh, we co founded the business, and the whole motivation was around how can we resolve some of the supply chain bottlenecks that we have around the food industry. And the reason why we're a B2B e-commerce business that's focused on food is because 50 to 60% of consumption on the continent or disposable income on the continent is going towards food. And that's a huge amount of disposable income to be going into food. When I compare this to the US, consumers in the US were spending about 52% of their disposable income on food in the 1870s. Today, that number is about 6.5%. So a huge improvement over the last 150 years. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to lower this amount uh, in the next few years and not necessarily have to wait 150 years to achieve what the US has achieved in food security. So that's essentially what we do. And uh, DFC has uh, been an, invest in, an investor in, uh, in Trigger Through Debt. And, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. So, you know, I'm actually glad that I'm going to get to talk to you because you're from two different countries, right? I think sometimes you and I both know when we talk about Africa, you know, I, I, I hear from some of my friends, they talk about this big mass and actually there are 50 some odd countries with hundreds of languages. My hundred, my husband is from Nigeria. I know there are at least 600 languages in his country alone. And so one of the things that you all can share though is your experience with accessing finance so um i'll start with you peter and then ambrose i want you to share what what has it been like for you trying to access finance as an entrepreneur um i, I just kind of want to get your thoughts about that experience thank you so much uh, roxanne for that so uh i'll share my journey especially from the early days it's, it's, it's very difficult as, a, as an entrepreneur to access finance because what you find is that uh, the local banks basically want to finance a company with track record. So as a startup, it's very, very difficult then to access that type of funding. So, and then, and then by then, when we were starting to get about seven years ago, the whole VC and impact investing ecosystem was not very, very well developed. So what I had to do is I had to finance a business in the early days. Luckily, I was working for Coca-Cola. So it was all around, you know, personal savings, accessing uh, unsecured debt uh, at a personal level, giving personal guarantees to raise the capital. And it got to a point where, you know, we got uh, knee deep in debt. And my wife and I had to uh, sell our matrimonial home to keep on financing the business. And that's what then built the track record which then allowed us then to access uh, VC funding. And after accessing the VC funding, then at least then we built the track record. You talked about bankability. We started building the track record. We started building the management team and that made us access uh, uh, some of the facilities that we have today. For example, the debt facility that we have with, uh, with DFC. But I would say that for an average startup, I consider myself very lucky because of my career and my profession in that I was able to access these resources. But for many startups, it's a, it's a journey filled with a lot of trials and tribulations that they try to finance their dreams. So I would say that it's been a difficult journey. Now we've become fairly successful. Uh, we've raised close to $100 million over the last seven years. So, but I would say that uh, it gets easier down the road, but when you start, it's very, very difficult. And you have to have that tenacity and perseverance as an entrepreneur, just to keep on uh, dealing with the challenges that you need to overcome to build that bankability and credibility. Thank you. And, and, and what was nice was, I know that when you started, you started with a small investment from our portfolio impact fund. So, and to just kind of see where you are today. Ambrose, I want to hear your thoughts because you're operating in a very different economy and you're now acting as a financier or you're helping to support other entrepreneurs. So talk to me about the challenges that you've seen with yourself and others trying to access um, capital. Uh, okay, I, I completely share with uh, what uh, Peter just uh, discussed. Uh, but in addition to what he said, uh, some of the challenges we faced 
as a, a financial institution is that uh, trying to get access uh, to capital from the local banks and those uh, in the sub-regions, the DFIs in the sub-region, uh, there were so many requirements uh, that we had to meet. Uh, most of it was difficult to meet. One of them is that uh, they want a certain asset size before they will invest in your business. Uh, we also found out that uh, interest rates are relatively high. And if I'm going to lend to SMEs, which is believed to the engine of growth for every economy, then I needed to get the right in, uh, interest to be able to uh, lend to them. So that was also uh, very tough uh, for us to get the, the very good interest rates uh, to lend uh, to people. Then also, in terms of tenure, we realized that we were getting very short-term uh, offers, uh, two years. Uh, if you are very lucky, five years uh, to, to be uh, for, for a facility. And if we are looking at giving people uh, enough time to be able, like those in the manufacturing sector, to be able to uh, turn around those monies, we needed a longer time to be able to also be flexible to do these SMEs. Then you, we also realized that some of them were focusing on uh, set, uh, specific sectors, maybe one or two sectors. They don't want to diversify into other sectors. So that was also a big challenge. And the, for us, the biggest is the collateral requirements. Uh, they want you to uh, come up with uh, so many, some, some were even asking for a bank guarantee. Uh, so the point is that for, uh, for me to get a bank guarantee, probably then the, the bank should rather give me the money than to get a bank guarantee. So the, the, the requirements for collateral were also very outrageous. So uh, for us, that was our experience trying to access uh, credits from the local banks and also the sub region. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think what's interesting here is this is a Pan-African group of more than 200 entrepreneurs that are on the line. And so one of the things I think that's exciting about talking to both of you is that you're in different countries. Um, you're facing different kinds of challenges, but the challenges are the same. And so I'm hoping that as participants hear you, it resonates for them, the experience that they have. So talk to me about, and this might be the last question because I, I wanna be respectful of your time. We're going full over just because there's so much to share, but talk to me a little bit about what the experience has been like working with the DSC? How has working with us helped to facilitate, you know, the dreams of your business? Ambrose, you can start. Peter, and then I'd love, I'd love to have your thoughts as well. Well, uh, for us, uh, it's been exciting working with DFC. Uh, first of all, uh, with DFC facility, uh, we've been able to strengthen our business. Uh, we've been able to grow our bottom line by more than 300 or 400 uh, percent. Working with DFC, we've gotten the right type of funding uh, for the SMEs. Uh, DFC has allowed us more time to pay them back. Uh, they've given us uh, room uh, to deal with uh, value addition sectors. Uh, they, are, they haven't restricted us uh, so much. Uh, with DFC facility, we've, we've also been able to create employment uh, for many. Um, as of today, we can count over 8,000 jobs we have created directly uh, to the SMEs. Uh, these are direct jobs out of our loans, and we believe many more jobs have been added uh, to to, uh, to, to, to this, uh, what we, we are doing. Um, I should also say that uh, due to the DFC facility, we've be, become more conscious of what we do with our environment. Uh, part of the requirement 
trying to access DFC facility for was for us to come up with a social and environmental policy. And this has made us very conscious of what we do as, as far as our environment is concerned. And finally, I should say that uh, for me to be in Liberia, what brings me happiness is the fact that I'm able to empower the ordinary Liberian to grow Liberia. And that is what our business does. And that is what DFC has allowed us to do uh, in this market. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I know that your work is catalytic in that sense that you're able to invest in smaller businesses, support them so that they can then employ others. Peter, you know, what you're doing, I think, is so critical to really providing efficiencies in the agricultural sector. Talk to me about the impact that working with the DFC has had on your business. Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne. I think uh, the challenge of entrepreneurship in Africa is that uh, one, you have to uh, work on the intellectual property of the problem that you're trying to solve. And then two, you have to create a supportive environment or ecosystem to support your very own business, because in some instances that does not exist. And uh, one of the things that we really appreciate uh, having worked with DFC is uh, especially during the diligence process. It really brought up our level of governance in terms of uh, what should be a, a decent threshold, and that made it easier for us to even access funding in a much, much uh, later rounds of, of financing. So the key thing is that one was just around that uh, whole capability uh, lift internally, because sometimes people might uh, look at diligence as more of a, pro a problem or a, a challenge to overcome. And, you know, we've taken a different approach in terms of taking it as a learning experience. Uh, moving forward. So, 1 thing uh, that, that that really helped 2nd thing is that it helps us also to open up other sources of uh, financing uh, down the road. We've been able to raise a lot more equity and debt as a result of uh, the credibility that DFC brought uh, to the to the company. But the key thing is that moving aside from uh, financing, I think is also talking about the impact that we've managed to create as a, as a business. You know, when I look at, say, for example, some of the value chains that we've managed to uh, get to be very, very successful, for example, the banana value chain, today, most of uh, Kenya or most of Nairobi actually pays around 20% uh, less for bananas than they were doing five years ago on account of some of the work that we've done, which is essentially starting to bear fruit. And this, uh, this year, we're having about 40,000 retailers uh, being touched by Trigger every month. Uh, being supplied goods and creating that convenience and starting to also provide financial uh, inclusivity through some of the fintech products that we're starting to offer uh, to informal retailers. And hopefully they can then start thriving in their very small businesses and hopefully that can then grow in a way that they can sustainably provide for their families. So I would say that uh, I'm very, very excited to be part of a business where the more you grow, the more lives you touch and the more impact you create and to have partners like uh, DFC uh, who actually believe in, uh, in our vision and uh, what it is that we're trying to do for the continent. Thank you all both for your time. Um, every time I hear both of you speak, I get you know kind of teary-eyed and inspired um, about the role that you're playing in really fostering economic development. And it's just wonderful to, you know, that through this job, I've gotten to get to know both of you and really hear your stories. Um, what I'd like to do now is transition to Q&A. Peter has offered to stay and answer questions for those of you who are interested. Ambrose has an crazy, amazing busy schedule. He And he was willing to participate. This is maybe the fourth of these I've asked him to participate in. Peter, because he's so committed with the DSC, drove and like rushed to his house, having had another meeting so that he can participate. So both of these gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with us. Now we're going to transition to Q&A. Um, Participating in the Q&A are going to be Dia Martin. She's our Managing Director for uh, Social Enterprise Finance. Um, John Onwalu, he's the Managing Director for the Office of Equity Investments. As I told you, equity is a new product that we have. Um, and John is heading some of those activities up. 
um, and I'm excited to have him participating. And then it looks like Megan Buckley will, is also here. She heads up our, she's part of the uh, technical assistance team. So she'll answer questions around that. Let's get started um, and let's talk about the, the questions that people tend to ask. I'm gonna just throw one out there um, that everyone tends to ask me is, which is, um, about the interest rates, what's the average interest rate yeah, that people can expect, or, or, or what are the parent, what are the things that factor into the kind of interest rate that someone could expect to get? Sure, thanks, Roxanne. And first, I, I want to say it's just an absolute pleasure to be here, and really excited about this opportunity with the Stanford C program, and to work with all of you. And quick plug for the Portfolio for Impact and Innovation, which is the program I lead that focuses on early stage enterprises, companies, and funds, and is actually the, the program where we were able to support Twiga. So the interest rate question, I, I think that's a really interesting question. And the simple answer is it varies. Um, when we look at interest rate, we look at market rates, we also look at the tenor or the structure of our, of our loan. So we'll look at if a loan is unsecured or secured, what the tenor is and what the collateral. The other thing that we look at that's very important, obviously the cash flows and the ability to service the debt, but also what the project or the business can support. So our view is we want to provide you a sustainable financing to grow your business. And we do not want to have a rate that would put the business in jeopardy. However, we need to look at our risk adjusted return. So, so the answer is it varies, but what we like to do is work with our client and, and come up with a rate and pricing that, that makes sense for the business and makes sense for the DFC. I hope that is helpful. It is, it is. John, I'm gonna ask you a question that I often get asked. Um, which is, you know, are you all open to doing things where you're using both equity, debt, and technical assistance? People often are like, how do we get all of it in one place? But can you talk a little bit about how the equity program is working right now and what kinds of things you're looking for? Thanks, Roxanne, and uh, excited to connect with everybody here. It's uh, it's amazing to be a part of this and, and, and speak to a bunch of inspiring entrepreneurs and hear from some of those that have been DFC clients. Uh, specifically, Roxanne, to your question on how we plan on utilizing DFC's direct equity authority, uh, we're looking for emerging companies, so focused on earlier stage businesses that um, can you know, are, are interested in you know, taking on equity capital um, as opposed to debt capital initially. That being said, though, I think one of the key skills that, that Roxanne uh, mentioned earlier is DFC has a full suite of financial tools that we hope to utilize along the life cycle of a project or opportunity where, you know, you may take technical assistance as you're looking to grow your business or uh, as you're looking to, uh, you know, do a feasibility study on expanding into a certain region, and then we can provide equity capital. And then uh, as the business grows and scales um, to having debt or credit characteristics, we can eventually give you a loan at that point. Um, but excited to answer any more questions and hopefully Roxanne, that gives you an insight into how we plan on utilizing the various financial uh, tools that DFC has. Okay, and and thank you so much, Megan. Um, a question that came for you is something is is this one? Um, to what extent does the screening and due diligence apply to technical assistance? So, okay, sorry. I'm just trying to get my video on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, so for technical assistance, all of our um, technical assistance will be in support of a DFC transaction. So if the technical assistance um, is for the pre-investment side to help get the project ready for a DFC financing decision, then um, we will have a screening meeting um, and go through the approval process. Um, to, and in consultation with the relevant investment officer from DFC um, to make sure that any of the work that we're supporting is relevant to help get the, the project ready for financing. And similarly, if it's a post-investment technical assistance, 
where DFC has already provided a loan or equity investment or insurance, then the goal of that technical assistance is to increase the developmental impact or improve commercial sustainability. And similarly, we go through the same approval process with a screening meeting um, and the a, a separate approval process, but it's post um, DFC trans, um, commitment from, from the loan side. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That's really helpful. Um, if there are follow-ups, please feel free to ask. Um, a question that I, I want to throw out to Peter that that, off, that we've often gotten asked is, okay, so tell me what's been hard about working with the DFC or what's the learning curve? What was the learning curve like for you as you worked with the DFC for the first time? Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne. So, uh... So I had the fortune of uh, having my co-founder initiate uh, the whole uh, DFC uh, conversation because uh, although I co-founded the business, I just took on my role uh, about uh, two years ago. But uh, my learning uh, working uh, with uh, DFC, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, learnings that I, I called out is uh, on, the, uh, on the governance side and, and just the amount of due diligence and the amount of uh, uh, maybe uh, what I'd call uh, uh, pre-financing uh, uh, conditions that uh, we had to meet more or less uh, helped us really, really reflect on uh, how we run our business and how our governance should sit. Because what has happened since the DFC financing is, and, and I think also is that it's, a, it's, 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 not a, it's not an easy or straightforward process if you're going through the first time. But what I say is that if you have a learning mindset, in terms of, you know, how do you ensure that this is an opportunity for you maybe to upskill your team and ensure that uh, maybe you clean up your data room or have a better structure around your data room. What it does over time is that it really eases uh, due diligence uh, going forward. I think if I think about uh, what we thought about due diligence in our data rooms, maybe four or five years ago, uh, every time you thought about uh, fundraising and it got to that point of due diligence, it was like, uh, a very, very harrowing experience where you felt that it was like a game of chance that you're getting into because you don't know what to expect on the other side. And over time, what has done is actually get us to a point where uh, uh, we really have upped our game in terms of due diligence and how we organize our data and how we're actually able to demonstrate the element around uh, things like bankability, management capability, which are some of the things that uh, the DFC is very, very keen on. Because if I look at the investment that was made in Twigger, the commitment was made when we were significantly earlier stage than we are today. So again, uh, taking an investment from DFC at that early stage meant that we really had to then demonstrate those elements around bankability and management capability. And I think that for me is the state change that it created uh, in the business on account of how we then looked at the whole process. So, so I think it's been a very, very positive uh, journey for us. and. Uh, and, and I think even uh, working uh, on an ongoing basis um, has, has been, uh, has been uh, not very, very onerous. And I mean, it's just like any other debt provider. But I think the key thing that we found to be a benefit is that uh, DFC is also taking risk in earlier stage businesses. And I think for me, that's a very, very positive uh, development, even with a recent development around the smaller ticket sizes going through up to half a million dollars. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So this, this question um, then makes perfect follow on for the question I have for you, Dia, which is how does the DFC define SMEs? That's one of the questions that someone raised. Okay. Sure, I think that's a, a great question and it really depends on what window you're looking for financing uh, from the DFC. For this new Africa Small Business Catalyst Program with the financing from, I believe it's 50,000 to 500,000, we're really looking at earlier stage SMEs. So these would be SMEs that might have revenue under, under 500,000, under a million or so. So very early stage, maybe a, a, a few employees. For the Portfolio for Impact and Innovation Program, we're looking at larger, um, but still what we would call SMEs. So these are companies that have revenue of over a million or maybe approaching a million dollars. Um, they have a track record of a few years and they've um, already started to, to build out their operations and are really looking at, at financing to scale. And, and that would be financing of up to 10 million. But then we also um, look at 
SMEs that are more mature and that have revenues maybe of up to 15 million. These are much larger SMEs, and I'd say they're more mid-sized enterprises. We can provide financing that meets that window as well. So, so I think the message here is that we really want to be a, a provider of financial services throughout the life cycle of a company. And we view this as a partnership. So clients can grow with us. They can come in from this African Small Business Catalyst Program to the Pi Squared Program, all the way up to the standard DFC financing tool. And while we're doing that, we can uh, kick in some equity and technical assistance as well. So the goal is long-term partnerships. Thank you. One of the questions that has been raised, as I said, there are um, almost 200 participants on the call is, you know, how do, what advice do you have for people who are facing fragile, who, who operate in fragile economies or in economies where they face exchange rate challenges? And how have you worked, how has the DFC worked with those kinds of companies? So the DFC is developing its ability to make local currency loans. That's something that we're really excited about and is part of the expanded toolkit of the DFC versus OPIC. We've also looked at providing guarantees to banks um, so that one could secure local currency financing with the DFC guarantee. And we, we feel that that unlocks windows for financing. And then we also look at ways to flexibly um, provide capital so that the risk is mitigated. We've also funded uh, hedging platforms such as MFX which has a window to provide hedging and local currency specifically for SMEs. So that uh, provides, a, a, I guess, a plethora of ways that we look to mitigate FX risk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. I know that's, that's a, a, an area of constant questioning. Um, John, for you, one of the questions that was raised is, why would someone work with the DFC um, to get equity versus another partner? What do you think the DFC brings to the table as an equity provider that's unique? Yeah, I think, I think it's a good question and it probably comprises all the, all the things discussed today. We have almost 50 years of experience investing in emerging markets, um, which brings with it, you know, the expertise of, of strategic and diplomatic relationships across various countries. You know, you mentioned, Dia just mentioned local currency capabilities for future financing opportunities, political risk insurance and technical assistance. I think that the holistic suite of, uh, of you know, financial tools that we can afford you as, a, as an entrepreneur um, can play a role as a one-stop shop financing solution. Additionally to that, given you know, our mandate is more development focused versus financial return, um, there isn't necessarily a duration on you know the time that we would need our money back. There was a, qu a question by Brian Hammond in the in the chat that asked uh, if if shareholders have to buy back shares at some point in the future. That's not a requirement, um, given we're not a traditional you know private equity fund with a five year capital raising cycle and a five year payback cycle. We hope to be long term financial partners um, to companies as they grow, and uh, really want to make sure that you know you grow in an ethical way uh, and support and develop the communities that you're trying to serve. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great answer. So to Dia, another question that's come up is what types of collateral is acceptable to the DFC? What are the collateral requirements for debt financing? So again, that varies. Um, if it's, we want to, first of all, we want to look at the feasibility of taking collateral. Is it economic and does it make sense for our loan? And we are recognized that a hindrance, especially for many SMEs, is the collateral requirement. So we try to be flexible and look at opportunities when it makes more sense to go unsecured or when it makes sense to take collateral. So that's determined on a case by case basis. Obviously, if you're a technology company or an asset light company, we would be more flexible on that. If it's a capital intensive company where there is a, a larger piece of collateral, collateral where it's economic to take it, we would do that. But we look at it on a case by case basis. And again, this brings the focus back to partnership 
and really looking at what makes sense to support a company's growth over the longer term. Okay, thank you, thank you. Another question that, that has come up is, um, you know, our goal is, as we've talked about is not to crowd out the private sector. So Peter, can you talk to us about your relationship now with the national banks that are in your area or the regional banks, et cetera, you know, now that you've been working with the DFC for so long? Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne. So, so the thing is that what we're finding now is that uh, um, I think commercial banks, uh, maybe pre-COVID, uh, were, 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 were basically, or let me put it this way, local financing uh, companies were being crowded out by government borrowing. Uh, because, you know, I think a lot of banks essentially invested in a lot of treasury bills. And I think as that um, revenue stream starts to wane, we're seeing a lot more innovation starting to come through from, uh, from commercial banks. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things, for example, right now, we're exploring a working capital financing uh, deal with local banks, because one of the things that we realize that could be a significant opportunity is to start thinking about uh, how you can disintermediate some of uh, the commodities uh, through uh, toll parking and driving your own private label. That means that, you know, your working capital uh, needs grow from maybe having uh, three, four, five days of inventory to now having uh, 45 days of inventory because now you're managing the whole supply chain. So because we're starting to see a lot more flexibility in structuring that, then we're starting to uh, think more about uh, uptaking some of the local uh, financing arrangements that are available. And uh, and the key thing also is, uh, you know, we're weaning ourselves off, you know, some of uh, the reliance maybe from uh, our early impact uh, debt investors who are starting to see us becoming a more and more mature company. And we need to then start thinking about how we can transition to other sources of debt. So I think the key thing is that now we're more or less looking at a, a broader repertoire of uh, sourcing of uh, debt. And, and I think the local market then is starting to make a, a lot of sense. And I think a lot of it is also due to uh, maybe the evolution that we're seeing also happening uh, at this, uh, this particular point in time. Got it. So Dia, another question people have had, I think I raised it, I, this is the question that people always ask, is, you know, on average, how long does it take to get from pre-screening pre to, you know, the wire in my, my account? How long does it take to get from pre-screening to approval and disbursement? I love that question, Roxanne. And again, I'll give you my standard answer. It varies. So <laughs> we typically say that a transaction from start to finish takes six to eight months. So it'll take that time from that initial conversation until we close with our first dis disbursement. Some transactions take longer and some take shorter periods of time. Our record, um, so far, or since I started with the DFC has been 65 days. So I, I highlight that as a record. Maybe we will match that again, but typically it'll take from four to eight months, usually six to eight months. So get started now if you're interested. Don't hesitate to reach out to Blaine or Jacob. Great, great. So I think we're gonna wrap up. We're about a little, you know, we had it from a nine to 11, but unless we have more questions, I may, um, start wrapping up. I want to give each of you a chance to provide, you know, your bit of advice. Um, I've talked quite a bit, but, you know, to, you know, you, Dia, John, Megan, Peter, um, I know Ambrose has even stayed, and I really appreciate you taking the time. For those of you who are considering getting financing from the DFC, um, partnering with us, what kinds of advice would you offer? Sure, I'll go first. I think this is really helpful today. Some of the information that you shared, Roxanne, about coming to us with a, a complete package that references the bankability, sustainability of the project. The other thing I would say, it is never too early to have a conversation. What we've done many times is had conversations with clients about certain milestones that we'd like to see before we start our financing process. And it's always good to, to be in conversation even prior to when you need financing so that when you're ready to go, we are familiar with the company, you're familiar with us. And it makes the 
process, ease of execution for the financing process a lot easier on all sides. So those would be my points of advice or recommendations. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that as well. And um, as Jane mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the AIAs that they have locally based in the regions um, in Africa are incredible. It's an amazing job at uh, sourcing and working with entrepreneurs very similar to yourselves. I think another thing that they do really well is they have a really keen understanding of the various financial tools and products that we have here at the DFC and could be a really good uh, first connection point. So I, I know that Vin might have mentioned some emails um, that you can reach out to for a coffee chat, but I think what would be good uh, is to reach out early, uh, walk us through your business, so we can figure out the right financing tool uh, that might fit you best, and then go from there. And Megan, what about you? What, what advice would you offer? So I just wanted to emphasize also the two, what John and Dia just said about coming to us early because that's where a lot of, you know, where our support can come in on the technical assistance side is to help you with share, help you with marketing studies or any kind of feasibility studies or support that you may need to help advance you closer to DFC financing. Okay. And then I want to hear from our entrepreneurs. Um, Ambrose, if you're open to chatting, if you have something you want to share, uh, some last bit of advice. Peter, if you have some last bit of advice before we close up, that'd be great. Uh, my, my advice or recommendation is for uh, the businesses to do their homework first uh, before approaching DFC. Uh, you, you have to make sure that you have your house in order the basic things that uh, Roxanne talked about, bankability, etc. You must make sure it's part of your presentation to DFC. And uh, secondly, you need to have some patience because eventually when you get uh, DF access to DFC, it opens bigger doors for your business. Thank you, Ambrose, and thank you again for, for um, being with us. And Peter, do you, what about you? What would you like to share as well? Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne, and uh, Ambrose, just building on what you say. I think the key thing is that uh, you need to anticipate uh, what will be the requirements uh, from a financing standpoint. And the key thing is that, you know, starting to structure or uh, internally structure your business in a way that uh, allows you then to uh, be bankable, if I may use that word, in terms of all the facets that you essentially need to think through. And by putting all this together, uh, what it then does is uh, it then ensures, sorry, it then ensures that, uh, you know, uh, your chances of success uh, are, are increased. And the key thing is that as Ambrose said, then what this does also is that it starts opening other doors once you have DSC financing in place, because then it brings a lot of credibility to you as an organization. Uh, to the external world. So, um, so, but I would say that uh, amazing work that everybody at DFC is doing in terms of providing capital uh, to uh, to develop some of the entrepreneur, 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 entrepreneurship ventures that we have on the continent. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, Davis, I want to give you the opportunity to make closing remarks. Um, as we wrap up, thank you all for, for giving us your time, for sharing so much time with us. It's been great to have you here to participate and to learn a little bit more about the DFC. And Davis is just going to make another plug for the survey. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, you know, on behalf of Stanford Seed, what an incredibly insightful session, uh, in, packed with information. Um, we just really, really appreciate all the time that uh, the, all the DFC and AS. DF and the clients all the time that you put into planning this for Stanford Seed. And I'm really happy to see the hundreds of you on, on the Stanford Seed side who, who showed up for today. Um, this collaboration will continue. So, so do as Roxanne says, take that five minute survey because it's gonna provide a lot of key insight for Seed and for DFC. So we could walk this collaboration forward in the future and continue to, to work with you all. But your insight as the customers is key. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we're grateful uh, to to our partners. And back to you, Roxanne. Thanks. Thank you. So just to let you know, next steps are that you will, in the fall, we're going to be reaching back out to you again. By then, we will have collected the data from the survey. Hopefully, you will have participated in a focus group 
Um, and then we're going to be using those recommendations to finalize the, this product that will be launched in the fall. Um, then, because of your participation, we will be having another event like this. And at that point, we're really going to be going into some detail around how you can apply. We're going to talk to you about using our technology and really walking you through the process to enable you to be as successful as possible in participating and working with us. So you have two ways to work with us. Today, if you're interested and you're like, oh, I want to, I'm interested in a $3 million, $1 million, $5 million loan today, or I want to learn about equity today, you can reach out to Blend and Jacob. So you can do that right after we get off the call. The second thing that you can do is in the, you can wait. In the fall, we're going to have a smaller um, product available in the amount of between 50 and $500,000. Um, we're going to have a um, RFA that we, we've put out and it's going to include, um, and it's really going to be based in, in big parts on your feedback. And that is fantastic. I can't tell you, I come from a background of product development and strategy. We often don't get the opportunity to hear to get customer voice just because of how we're structured as a government and we've been able to do something really innovative and we're excited about it. And, in, and because of your participation, we really want to help you if you want to work with us. And so we're going to have something available in the fall where we're going to review results and give you the chance to ask any question about participating in the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program. So thank you so much for your time. I know it was a lot of time and a lot of information, but I really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Have a great day, a great afternoon, and thank you.